this is Yaro Starak, and welcome to the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. Today's guest is Corey Huff. Hi there, thanks for pressing play on this EJ podcast episode with Corey, who's going to share an interesting story of how a Shakespearean actor eventually became an online marketer and today makes as much as $180,000 per year teaching artists how to sell their artwork online. That's coming up in a moment. First, if you haven't signed up to get email notifications of when new EJ podcasts are released, go to interviewsclub.com and click a button there where you can then enter your email address to sign up for the early notification email list. You'll get every new podcast as soon as it's released and also a series of my very best podcast interviews from the archives. That's interviewsclub.com. Now here's the interview with Corey Huff. Hello, this is Yarrow and welcome to an Entrepreneur's Journey podcast interview with someone who's doing something that I think is possibly one of the most powerful needs in the creative industries, which is basically how to make money from your art. And my guest today makes a living, uh, well, has a background as an artist, but also makes a living today helping other artists to monetize their work through the internet. And I love this because it's obviously everything I teach with blogging and selling information products, but it's in a market, I feel, that really needs this kind of education on how to market themselves online. So I'm very excited to bring on Corey Huff from theabundantartist.com onto the podcast today. Hello, Corey. Hello, Yaro. Thank you so much for having me on. So uh, I obviously want to dive into how you uh, basically got this business going, and not only that, how you do actually teach artists to sell their work. But let's just quickly recap where you're at right now. So you told me you've just about done $180,000 this year. About half of that comes from selling your own information products, so courses online, and the other half from uh, affiliate marketing and coaching consulting. And you've got about 22,000 people on your email list. So it's a fairly solid business. I think anyone listening to this call would be pretty happy with that kind of result. So um, I'm looking forward to learning how this all came about. But I've been told in the pre-interview that you have an interesting background. And since this is the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast, we have to go back into your background first and discover... Uh, how you became what you do today. And it's not surprising, I guess, if you're an artist that you might have a somewhat eclectic background. That might be a cliche, but I think a lot of artists have tried a lot of things over the years. So um, normally I'd ask, did you go to you know school and, and have any entrepreneurial endeavors during that period? But I don't know if that still makes sense to you. I'll ask anyway. Did, did that happen with you? A little bit. Uh, so essentially my, my background, like I got into theater uh, when I was a kid, when I was a little a little kid, like ten like ten years old, and I uh, started just did that very regularly. I, I was in a touring Shakespeare troupe when I was in high school. Um, all my friends were performers and artists and people like that. And then I I went to uh, theater school. I got a bachelor of fine arts degree in acting. And when I uh, got out of school, wait, well, oh, let me back up. We're talking about. The, the, if we're talking about the beginnings of my my interest in entrepreneurship, when I was in college uh, and I knew that I wanted to be an actor, I started reading books uh, about actors and reading interviews with actors who were actively working in the field and stuff, and figuring out okay, how do these how do other people like do it? Like, how do you make it as an actor? Kind of a thing, and. I, from the very beginning, I really had no interest in being like a celebrity, right? Like I, I wanted to be Steve Buscemi when I was in college. Right. Um, if you don't know who Steve Buscemi is, uh, I guarantee you recognize his face because he's in everything. Uh, he's he was uh, the, in in Billy Madison. Remember the the crazy guy who puts lipstick on, and then he's got the list of people that he's going to kill, and he crosses Billy Madison's name off the list. Um, so I wanted to be Steve Buscemi because nobody knew who he was, but he was in everything and he worked all the time. Right. And so I was trying to study actors like that. And what I did, one of the things that I discovered is that a lot of actors had what they called complementary careers, which was basically a second job um, that they worked until they made enough money from their acting to, to get by. 
right? So I figured, okay, well, I need to figure out a good complementary career for myself. So I started looking at what other actors were doing. And, uh, you know, there was the, the sort of cliche of waiting tables and doing catering, banquet work, and that kind of stuff, which wasn't very interesting to me. So I started trying to start different businesses on my own. Um, I did everything from a couple of networking mar- network marketing opportunities, multi-level marketing things. Uh, I tried uh, selling insurance. I tried being a talent scout. Uh, and then when I right sh- about a year before I graduated from college, I discovered MySpace and I started blogging on MySpace. And that worked as a way to get people to my shows. And so then I was like, oh, there might be something, there might be a thing, like something to this blogging thing. So after I graduated from college, I started a couple of different blogs, uh, just trying to see which one fit my voice best and which one would bring me some traffic and potential business. And I, cut, I tried a couple of different blogs. They didn't work out. I, I, I actually started a marriage blog because <laughs> I got married and uh, I wanted to like learn how to be a better husband, right? Mm-hmm. And most of the information on the internet at the time was you know, basically Playboy, GQ, and some other really bad blogs, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so I was like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll, go look, I'll go make this marriage blog. And, and that actually got pretty big, but I couldn't figure out how to monetize it, so I shut it down. And uh, then I was working for an internet marketing firm. I, I, when I moved to Portland, my wife and I were looking for survival jobs, and I found this job uh, at this network, at this internet marketing company, and we were selling uh, Google Ads. Right, we were doing uh, search 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 PPC management, and I was learning a lot there and learning how all that worked. This was like nine years ago, and while I was there, I started another blog on the side, and that blog I was I started reaching out to other creatives and saying, you know, how are you using the internet to grow your whatever your creative business is. And the people that were really receptive to it and responsive to it were artists, the painters, sculptors, those kind of people. And they were, they were willing to spend, to share their time. You know, like this is in the early nascent days of Etsy. Uh, this is when people, when a lot of artists were selling original art on eBay and making a killing, uh, before all of the, the Chinese copies flooded the eBay market. Like there, this was the wild, wild days of the, of the internet. And so I just started blogging about that and what I was learning at the internet marketing company I was working for. And was this around 2006, I'm thinking then, or, uh, 2007, or 2007, 2007 when, okay. when it started. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, so, so basically, I had this blog that I was running on the side, and then uh, Facebook started their ad platform, and I went to management of the company that I was working at, and I said, we should be doing Facebook ads. We're already doing Google ads. This is just you know, a different platform. And they were like, great, you do it. So I dove in, and I learned the Facebook ad platform back when it was when it was terrible back at the very beginning. And uh, we, I trained all of our, all the team at the company on how to, how to use it and how to support it and sell it. And it became a big hit at the company. And then uh, I ended up leaving that company. Um, and I tried to go off on my own that lasted about six months and I, I quit uh, or rather I quit my entrepreneurial job and went and found a, a day, another day job because I couldn't figure out how to make the company work. How was the but acting I, career going in all of this? Oh, oh, so uh, consistently with that, in parallel with all that, um, I was gigging out all the time. I was uh, doing a lot of stage work, uh, so Shakespeare and Greek tragedy and stuff like that. Um, when I first, I, I was really lucky when I first moved to Portland. I got cast in a small role at. Uh, is this little tiny theater company that specialized in, in doing only Shakespeare. But they performed in this little tiny theater called The Shoebox. And uh, so there was only like 30-something seats there. But it was a, sort of an influential little theater company where all the people in town who really loved theater came to that theater company. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got a little part there, which led me to a bunch of different parts right here in Portland and around town. And I ended up performing pretty much constantly for probably about four or five years before things slowed down a little bit. Uh, and then my wife and I left and we went, moved away for a year and then we came back earlier this year, which is sort of a side story. We can get to that. Like I, my business allowed me to travel. We, we spent the last year as digital nomads. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the acting career was going well uh, in parallel with all this. 
Um, I'll just check. Um, like a... not, your mic might be scratching against something, uh, Corey. I'm not sure if you're wearing it on a lapel or something. So. Um, there you is go. this any, is this any better? That's better. Yeah. Okay. I'm like all animated while I'm talking. I'm like moving <laughs> around, and my uh, it's not a lapel mic. It's just the the speaker wire is really okay. sensitive. Yeah. Because you're too busy it's, acting as you talk, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm really I'm really animated person. If we were on video, I might, like, I'd be gesticulating everywhere. Okay. Like, okay. Just, yeah. Um, yeah. So so I had this blog on the side that I had tried that I had when I when I left that old company, I was trying to turn it into a business, and I didn't I didn't figure it out. Like we, we were making money, but not enough to live on and we kind of ran out of savings. So I went and found another job and what was that, actually, job? um, so that job, oh, okay. I have to explain, like, I don't have to, but I feel like this will be interesting for your audience. So, <laughs> okay. so when I say I left that job, what actually happened is I got fired. Um, so despite all of the, the fact that I had like introduced Facebook ads and the company was making tons of money off Facebook ads and everything, they weren't paying me enough to live on. Like they were, I, they weren't paying me enough to pay my student loans. So I, uh, I, I was freelancing on the side and I had signed a non-compete agreement. So, uh, basically they fired me. I didn't think, I think I thought what I was doing was not competitive, but they disagreed with me. So they fired me and, uh, basically sent me a cease and desist letter after they fired me saying that I couldn't work in the internet marketing industry for four years. Jeez. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, essentially what I had to do was find a, a job in an industry, in a different industry that where my skills matter, where my skills matter. Right. And so I, I ended up working, going to work for a software startup, uh, a company that, uh, you know, when you go to a website and you log in with like your Google or Facebook account. Right. right. So we did, uh, that like the company that, that I worked with, they were one of the originators of that technology. And there's a bunch of other stuff that goes along with it. It sounds really boring, but it was actually super interesting because we were um, doing big data marketing. So if you log into a website with your Facebook or Google account, there's a ton of information about you that those companies can get, mm -hmm. right? Like they can get all your Facebook information and Google actually knows a ton about you too. Um, people make a big deal out of Facebook privacy, but Google probably knows just as much or more about you, uh, especially if you're a Gmail user, like Google knows a lot about you. So... Uh, my job was on the strategy team. Um, I performed a couple different jobs there, but my the majority of what I did was on the strategy team where I would look at what our customers were doing. These were Fortune 500 companies. I would look at what the customers were doing with all this data and make suggestions to them on how they could do more with it, both on the marketing side, like how they could integrate that data into their marketing, as well as on the technology side, how they, how they would, you know, the technical how-to of how they would do it. And uh, it was really fun. I got to fly all over the country and meet with uh, tech agencies and tech executives at all these different big companies and see how like a real business was run. And I, that was a two and a half year education on how a, a real company is run and, and how to do strategy and, and you know how to hit business numbers and all that kind of stuff. And the company that I was at grew from, I was employee number 24. We grew to just over 300 people while I was there. Uh, so that was a huge education for me. And eventually, and I still had the acting thing and, uh, the abundant artist on the side while I was working there. So super busy and the abundant artist eventually got big enough that I was so busy doing it that I was sort of essentially working two full-time jobs. Right. What, and, what were you actually filling the abundant artist with during those early days? Um, you know, in the early days it was, I, I was reaching out to other creatives and saying, what are you, what are you doing with your, what are you doing with the internet, right? Like, how are you selling your art online? And then I would do interviews and publish those interviews. And this is, I, I didn't do a podcast because I didn't, I didn't really have time to do a podcast. Like everything I was doing was via email um, because I had a job and I couldn't figure out a time to do, to record podcasts. Mm -hmm. So I was just doing email interviews with people and uh, people were generous with their time, shared their, shared their info with me. And so I was blogging uh, these interviews and then I was also blogging about internet marketing, right? So by that time, I had been in the internet marketing industry for three or four years and sort of knew how it worked. And I was able to make connections between selling art and, and the internet. And so initially, you know, our first course was, and this is such an awesome, hilarious thing because I, he I hear so many entrepreneurs do this. Our, our first course was 
everything I know in a course, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and so it was terrible because it wasn't really like a, a structured course. It wasn't a very good product, but it was, you know, me getting on the phone with eight other artists and saying, do X, Y, and Z and giving them way, 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 way too much to do so that they couldn't get it done. Right. And, uh, and then I sort of refined from there, right? Like that was six years ago that I started the abundant artist. Um, so we've been, we've been doing, um, that's what I'm looking for. We've been doing courses for that for almost that long. Right. Yeah. That's your yeah. probably one of the first people to do an online course for artists to help them how to monetize. Yeah. There were only, there were two or three people that I'm aware of who were doing that online. Um, and a couple of those people, two of those people are still online, but everybody else, it's, it's so interesting over six, being, being online for six years. That's not very long, but seeing how many people have come along and jumped, and jumped in to do the same thing and then also gone away in that same time. Right. Right. So can you, uh, I can see like, let, let's move forward. Cause I want to get to the point where you obviously had to make a decision between, you know, two things working full time, running the abundant artist.com and let's not forget you're still, I'm assuming kind of striving to become a paid actor. Is that like, I mean, you, I don't know if you were getting paid for the Shakespearean performances, but mm -hmm. I can't imagine that wasn't, that was full time income. If it was, no, 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 no. What, what was your thinking back in six years ago when all this was sort of happening at once? Yeah. So theater income is never full time, right? It, it, unless you're a Broadway star, uh, you can't make a living as a, as a theater actor, uh, with a very few exceptions, right? Like in most, most actors supplement their income with, they do film work or they teach or direct. Um, it's, it's, a, it's the kind of career where you do a lot of different things in order to make a living. Uh, and so because I don't really have a lot of interest in doing commercials, uh, I, I was looking to start a business to make a living to, to support my income. So yeah, I get paid to do stage work. Like I, I would be considered by most people's standards, I'd be considered a professional actor. Um, but Shakespeare doesn't pay very much. And the kind of, the kind of art that I'm interested in doing doesn't necessarily pay very much. Uh, because I enjoy doing new plays. And when you do a new play, it's usually in a really small theater for a really short play, really short run. Um, I'm in a new show in January written by a local Portland playwright here. Uh, we'll probably get, you know, it's, it's a 30 seat theater. So we'll get maybe a few hundred people to see it over the course of a run. You just can't make very much money off that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I'm for a lot of actors, that's sort of the dream because doing new work and, and getting to originate characters is really fun as an actor. Um, and a lot of that, but a lot of actors end up not being able to do that kind of stuff because they're they're doing a Christmas carol so that they can make a living. Mm. Right. So it, it's just depends on what your priorities are. Um, you know, if you want to do that kind of stuff as an actor to, in order to make a living, that's great and more power to you. Um, I like to keep my, my income a little bit separate so that I can do the kind of shows that I want to do. Right. So that was your thinking back then too. You're thinking, I don't need to see myself become a Hollywood actor and, and make a full-time income from this, but I want to be in control of my income. So your web business basically needs to be that, or you need to keep that job. Was that kind of your thinking back then? Yeah. Yeah. That was absolutely it. When I was a senior in college, we did, um, so in Salt Lake city, I went to the university of Utah in Salt Lake city at pioneer theater company, which is the big theater company in, in Salt Lake. Uh, there they, they do, they bring in New York actors to perform, uh, most of the lead roles there. And, uh, so my senior year, I, I got to be in a show with all these New York actors, and I got to hear from them firsthand, you know, what it's like to live in New York and make a living as an actor. And the lifestyle just sounded awful because they, you know, if you, if you want to live in New York and make an, make a living as an actor, a lot of actors, uh, they travel six months out of the year, right? You go on a touring show or you, you know, you fly from New York to Salt Lake to do a show for three months. Right. Um, and I really didn't want to do that. I, I thought that sounded kind of boring. Um, and, and, tenuous. And then uh, I had lived in Los Angeles for two summers during college, uh, directing for a children's theater out in, out in uh, Los Angeles. And 
I, I hated Los Angeles, just the culture, uh, the endless driving, right? Like <laughs> uh, commuting an hour each way to get to work and that kind of stuff. It just, it was really unpleasant. Uh, and so I wanted to, I didn't want to do the New York thing because it's so hard to live there. And I, and I wanted to live in a city where I could afford to live, where people were making art that they wanted to make instead of making things that are terrible so that they could get by. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that, that was sort of my, my thought process. So I can see then uh, that having your own entrepreneurial business it, it was the best solution because it's otherwise you keep a job, right? So uh, can you go back then to the point where the Abundant Artist, you're about to go and, and create a course. So that was your first course, the one you said was kind of a little all over the place because you tried to put everything in without really having a, a flow or a direction to it. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what situation you're at with the business by then? Was that the first attempt to make money from it? Yeah. So essentially I was probably about a year into blogging, right? I, I'd been uh, creating blog posts and interviewing artists and just posting lots of content to the blog, probably posting two or three times a week. And most of the posts were relatively short and not very good. Uh, by my current standards. It's funny to look back at content and be like, uh, anyway, uh, so about a year into blogging, I decided, oh, you know what, I'm going to teach a course. And, and I had a very small mailing list and I emailed everybody and said, Hey, if I do a course, would you guys be interested? And by the way, uh, this first one is going to be free. And if you want to do it, here's an application. And I, I made it an application only thing because I, since I was doing it for free, I wanted to make sure that I was getting people that I actually wanted to work with um, and, and people that were going to show up for the course so that I could figure out what it was and, and how to do it. So we did the first one for free and I recorded it and uh, basically turned around and sold those recordings. And that was, and that was it. Um, it was, was it you just teaching that? Yeah, it was just me. Uh, it was just me. And it was probably about eight hours worth of, uh, me talking. And I just basically sold that in, I think it was 10 or 11 individual audio clips. And I didn't know anything about transcription. I didn't know anything about PDFs or any of that kind of stuff. So it was basically just re audio recordings of me talking. And you, what were you talking about? <laughs> <clears throat> uh, so essentially I was talking about blogging and I'm trying to remember, like, in the very beginning, before we, before the way the course is now. Um, so, yeah, blogging and email lists and social media. So posting. And, and I was totally in love with Twitter at the time. So it was all about Twitter and Facebook. Okay. Because it would have been before Instagram and right. before Pinterest and all those things. So. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Or at least before they were big, yeah. All right, so uh, just quickly, because I love hearing the, the early setup process. I'm assuming, because you had that technical background, having worked for IT firms and, and you know, in, in marketing and, and pay-per-click and so on, uh, you knew how to set up, I'm assuming, a blog, a WordPress blog. It, was, mm -hmm. it wasn't my space anymore. It was your own blog with your own domain name. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of delivering this course, it sounds like it was pretty straightforward. Did you even just email back the MP3s or did you actually have a membership area? Uh, initially, it was just email, yeah. We just had uh, like an unpublished page on my website. Right. Uh, and I just put all the audio uh, files on that page. Right. And then, so you said you sold it after you made the first version with the free students. Right. So how did you take payment and how much did you charge? Um, we took payment with PayPal and I think I charged a hundred bucks or 90, 97. Cause I looked online to see what, what I should charge and people were charging prices ending in seven. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I charged 97. Yeah. Someone did that for the first time and everyone followed them. We all think it's smart, but it probably isn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know um, it's, uh, Derek Halpern recently did a study. He, he actually did like a legit uh, multivariate test on pricing. And he, he talks about it on his blog. I don't, there's a post up there somewhere, but he found no difference between a, a product that was 97 or $100 or $297 or $300. There was no difference in sales at all. Yeah. The problem with these tests is, you know, that's his audience, so everyone's audience sure. is different. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's let's keep going. And so, but I'm curious, how much did you make 
of, uh, of that first course. And you are scratching oh. again, by the way, Corey. So stop Sorry. moving. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, very little. I don't remember how much it was. Um, it, it was probably a few hundred dollars. It, it wasn't very much at all. We, my list was tiny. It was, you know, the list was a couple hundred people maybe. Um, I, I did not understand the importance of email marketing uh, at the very beginning. Um, I think uh, I really had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to sell something too when you're maybe not feeling that confident that what you're selling can work, right? Because if it's exactly. not working for you, there's a you're going to exactly. feel uncomfortable about it. So, so yep. you need to get your confidence up. But uh, at, after that experience, did you feel like, what am I doing? Um, I'm never going to make this work. Or were you excited? I want to do better. Like where were you at emotionally? Well, I think I was taking the the experiment. I was taking. I was looking at it as an experiment, right? Um, so I, I knew. I, I knew that I wanted to teach some courses online, but I didn't know how it worked. So by doing it for free for the initial people, I sort of learned uh, how, like, what an online course would be, and then getting feedback from the students and saying. Okay, I learned this and I tried this and this worked. And and actually one of the students, the thing that the thing that really helped was one of the students in the course, uh, she took what she learned and turned around and did quite well. Um and and she made quite a bit of money from what she learned in the course. Uh, but I think that's probably she. Uh, you know, I don't know if she would have done that with or without me. But she she really learned a lot from it and made a, made a lot of money from what she learned. So then I was able to use her as a testimonial, and then uh, I, I sort of took feedback from her and the other students and re, and revamped the course. Um, but I didn't really push it very much because I I knew that it wasn't quite there as a product yet. Um, and so I, I spent a little time working on it and then I started looking at other, other things that I could do. Um, so I offered a website, a WordPress installation service where we would actually, uh, you know, you, you buy your hosting through my affiliate link and then I, I'll, for 50 bucks, I'll chart in, install your WordPress setup and upload all your files. Gotcha. That, did that go yeah. well? Uh, yeah, that went pretty well. We did that for about two years until it finally got to the point where the rest of the business was growing well enough that the, the WordPress installation stuff wasn't scalable anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it didn't make sense for me to keep, keep doing that. Um, so we're actually, we, we stopped doing that about a year and a half ago. So during this time, were you still working full time? Mm -hmm. so yeah. How, um, how did you juggle this? Uh, um, so I was lucky in that that first early job at the internet marketing company. It was kind of a weird job where it was really really intense. So everybody went home at at four o'clock, and so my day was over at four or five o'clock every day. And it was a very strange company. So we were I was done by four or five o'clock every day. So I had the evenings to work. Uh, and I, so I set myself up, I set, I set it up like I had a second job. So every two, every Tuesday night when I got home, from, when I got home, I would eat something real quick and then I would work for the rest of the night and I'd often work until 10, 11 and 12 o'clock. Right. Um, so and writing then, blog posts and, and do you, I wanted to ask about marketing too. What, what, how were you actually getting, even though you only had 200 subscribers, you must've found some people. So how are you finding people? Right. Uh, blogging, uh, SEO. So, so my background in internet marketing in, in search engine optimization and pay P and PPC management, I didn't have a budget, so I didn't do PPC, but my site was optimized well enough. Um, and I, I did a lot of guest blogging, uh, in the early days. Okay. Uh, so I, I scored a guest post on Ramit Sadie's blog. I will teach you to be rich.com. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I guess posted on a bunch of different sites. And so those gave me some good links and some good initial traffic. And I went to a conference. Do you know who Dave D is? Sort of the, an old school copywriter is one of Dan Kennedy's copywriters. No, but um, keep going. so I, I went to one of Dan Kennedy's, uh, excuse me. I went to Dave D's conference in Los Angeles back in 2009 or 10 and uh, learned all about the power of email marketing. And so I turned around and, and put a, an, an email opt-in and put up a, an opt-in offer and uh, immediately my mailing list took off, right? 
um, just by having an opt-in offer, that was huge because I was already getting some traffic from all the the uh, Google rankings right, that right. I had. What was your offer like? What did you give away for free? Uh, it was basically, uh, I think it was called "Learn How to Sell Your Art Online uh, in Ten Weeks," and it was a it was a two emails a week for ten weeks that will show you exactly how to like how to set up a website and what to blog about and and how to research your market and all that kind of stuff. Some very pretty simple stuff. There were just short little emails that pointed to different blog posts that walked people, gave, gave people a handheld walkthrough on how to sell art online. Yeah, it's fantastic. That's actually what I often tell my students to do first, because you can write blog posts and you can write short emails to point to them. You've got an email course, right? So, yep. Yep. Okay. So take us forward with the business. What did you do next? What did I do next? So what did I do next before I went full time? So <laughs> yeah, take us to the point you got full time. Yeah. Obviously that's a, a big breakthrough, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I had the WordPress installs. I had the, the big course, the every, er, the everything dump course. Um, you know, the next, the next big thing that I did was uh, I decided to people, people were asking for courses on social media, right? And Facebook was the big thing. So I decided that I would do a Facebook course. So because I was really strapped for time, I decided I would do it as a webinar and and to have it be a paid webinar and i threw up a sales page and i emailed my list a couple times and said you know i'm going to do a webinar at this time then i'm going to record it if you'd like it it's 25 bucks and i had probably like 500 people sign up for that webinar wow That's paying amazing. 25 yeah paying 25 bucks each and i, I it, uh my mailing list so by that time we probably had about 5,000 people on the mailing list. And that had just grown organically from you writing content, doing mm -hmm. guest posts, so getting some search volume. Yep. I am kind of curious though, because you know, you're an artist, but you're an actor mm -hmm. as opposed to you know, a painter or even a writer or something. How, like, how are you teaching these people? What were you teaching them? <laughs> <laughs> what were you writing yeah. all these blog posts about? Yeah. So, so, a lot of a lot of it revolves around e-commerce, right? Uh, so, if you're going to sell art online, uh, for for some reason, the art world is about five to ten years behind the rest of the world on the internet, mm -hmm. right? Or at least five to ten years behind us, um, you and me, and other on online entrepreneurs. And a lot of really basic things are just completely foreign to fine artists. So, the idea of something as simple as putting your prices on your website. Uh, is is totally awkward and weird for artists. Um, the idea of uh, doing like a giveaway on social media so that you can build up your mailing list, also something that most fine artists don't really do. Um, even even things simple like building a relationship with your with with people directly because most. I don't know how much you know about it, but but a lot of fine artists sold through resellers or art galleries, right? Mm -hmm. And and so a lot of artists just hand their art over to the galleries and expect the galleries to sell all their art for them, um, which most of the time doesn't actually work out. But so so artists a lot of times just don't have any concept of even the the most fundamental parts of business and marketing. Yeah, it's it's you're making me think. Um, like I mentioned to you, my my father and his wife, they're both. Artists, they're painters and and sculptors, and uh, yeah, they. I could imagine a lot of what we consider starting points for internet marketing is it's something that they don't really spend a lot of time thinking about. They don't want to. They want to do their art. You know, yeah, do exactly, so, exactly. So, so something that one of my most popular blog posts is called the fifty fifty rule, mm -hmm. and basically, it's spend fifty percent of your time making art and fifty percent of your time selling it. And that concept just blows artists' minds because most artists think that being a full-time professional artist means spending 90% of your time making art. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not true. Uh, if you talk to any artist who is successful, uh, they'll tell you they spend maybe 30, 40, if they're lucky, 50% of their time making art. And then the rest of their time is, you know, marketing themselves, uh, packaging and shipping the art, going out to shows and conferences, 
uh, you know, talking to potential collectors, like it's, it, there's all this stuff that happens in a professional artist's career that a lot of people don't talk about. And there are no, if you go to art school and get a degree in, in painting or sculpting or whatever, uh, you don't have, you don't take any business classes. Yeah. Yeah. I can see it's, uh, it's kind of unfortunate because I think a lot of artists would prefer to just hand their art over to an agent and go, just make me money. And I, I just want to sit here in my, my art studio and make art. And, and it's, yeah. it's kind of sad because you have to go, well, and let's face it. I think, you know, even the people I teach, a lot of uh, the experts and anyone who's got a talent, even if it's not, you know, artistic talent, whatever, you're helping people mm -hmm. to do something. It's the marketing part that a lot of people don't like doing. They, they want to help. They don't want to sell and selling is uncomfortable. So the fact you have to do everything you just said, building relationships, pushing your content out into the world, you know, sort of being proactive in a, in a, I won't say pushy way, but it definitely isn't just sitting at home and creating your art or writing, or whatever it is you do. So it's a tough one. You almost have to decide, do I even want to do that? You know, can I, I'll just like, I think perhaps the answer is what maybe how you started. I have to accept the fact that my acting is not going to be a full-time income. So I'll need a survival job. Maybe a survival business is better, but a survival, some kind of survival income stream. So it sounds to me that you represent here a fantastic example of someone who's basically teaching internet marketing 101 to a group of people who really value that. They're not immersed in internet marketing. So if you can package up internet marketing 101 in a language and in a way that's applicable to their world, then it's really valuable, even though essentially you're teaching what we would consider really basic stuff. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true for the most part. Now, I'm lucky in the sense that now that I'm a little further into it, I am getting to teach some more advanced stuff. Um, with our, our flagship course, which is called How to Sell Your Art Online, uh, it really covers some stuff that, that is a little more advanced, but it's specific to fine artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so explain how you went from you know, not making a full-time income from the abundant artist to making a full-time income. Sure. So, so shortly after the, it's really funny because I checking my, my email, like after I put the webinar out and asked people to start signing up. So I had like almost 500 people sign up for the webinar and I turned to my office mate who knew that I was running a business and it was just her and I in that office. And, and I, and I told her what had happened and she was like, so when are you quitting? <laughs> and, um, and it was probably another six months or so before I, I handed in my, my resignation. But essentially after the webinar, things kind of went crazy for me. Uh, in addition to that course doing well. So I, I recorded the webinar, had 500 people sign up for it, sold it for 25 bucks a person and then recorded it and continued selling it. And it, and it's to this day, it's our best selling product. It, I, I sell, uh, copies of it, you know, a, a few every single day. Right. And, uh, so that was going well. And because that was going well, I was getting inquiries about personal coaching, uh, business coaching. And, and I decided that I would revive that, that behemoth course that I had put together. I said, okay, now that I have this Facebook course and this is going well, I should have something that I can upsell people to. So I started putting together, uh, it was called content marketing for artists which we've since rebranded it to how to sell your art online. But we created a course called content marketing for artists, which was an, and is an eight week course that covers everything from learning how to talk about your art, because this is one of the big obstacles that a lot of artists have is even just understanding how to communicate what your art is about and, and who you are as an artist. We cover that. And then we talk about blogging, email marketing and social media and, like media outreach, like desk blogging and newspapers and stuff like that. So it's a pretty intense, uh, lengthy course. And so I put that, I put that together and, uh, put that out and that did pretty well. Uh, and that's when things got really crazy. Like the business was taking over my life. Anytime I wasn't at work, I was working on the business. And uh, even a lot of times at work, I was working on the business, um, sort of answering emails on the slide and stuff. And, uh, I basically, I woke up one day and I had three more inquiries about 
one-on-one coaching work. And I just sort of had a panic attack. I said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't do both things anymore. So I called my wife and I said, I have to, I have to quit because I can't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do both things anymore. And I want the abundant artist to continue because I want that freedom. And, uh, she said, great. You know, my wife's been super, super supportive. Um, I think wives and spouses don't get enough credit when it comes to entrepreneurs making it right. Like my wife was, she's been there. We've been married for 13 years and she's seen every crazy scheme, every weird way I've tried to make money. And she's been supportive the whole time. She's like, okay, you know, whatever. (laughs) And, um, and she was like, great, you know, go ahead and quit your job. So I, I turned around and walked into my boss's office and I sat down and I said, I am quitting. And he was really upset. Uh, but also very supportive. He was like, that's awesome. Good, congr- good for you. I, I explained to him what was going on and he was like, congratulations. That's awesome. And we worked out a, an exit plan. Um, and I, I actually, it was, it ended up being six weeks before I completely left the job. Uh, I, I was involved in a lot of projects and I wanted to leave everything in good terms. So, uh, about six weeks later, I walked out the door and I uh, was ready to go full time. And, you know, I, I, one of the things that I had done is I had hired a business coach to work with me. And so I met with him the, the, the following Monday after I quit my job. Um, I think I quit on a Thursday or Thursday was my last day or something like that. And I took uh, the rest of the day and I went and had a donut and just sort of cel- celebrated my new freedom. <laughs> And, uh, and then when I, was this, uh, Corey, what year that was May of 2013. Okay. Yeah. And so the following Monday I went and met with a business coach and it was the most money I'd ever paid anybody for coaching. And we made a plan for the rest of the year for the next year. And, and it went really well. You know, I went from a really solid part-time income to, uh, making more money than I had made at my day job within a year. What did you do to, to get that ramp up in income? Uh, so I, I had the products in place. I had the Facebook course and I had the content marketing for artists and I had the WordPress installs and I had the coaching. So I had all of that in place. It was just a matter of, uh, promoting it more. So it, it, this is going to sound silly, but one of the very first things I did is I switched my email marketing from being like one newsletter a month to basically just sending out an email every time I had a new blog post, mm-hmm. which at the time was a couple times a week. And just doing that, my mailing list just started exploding in growth. It was really funny because everybody's always like, if I email people too much, they'll, they'll hate me. But when I started emailing people a couple times a week, my email list exploded. Like it doubled in size within six months or something like that. So it's like 10,000 people or something like that. And, uh, and then, so there was that. And then I also started doing, uh, some Facebook ads to grow our mailing list. And I started doing a lot more guest blogging. And I started a podcast. What uh, what pricing points were all your products? Or maybe it's what it is today. So do you want to run through the pricing points? And, and I'm assuming the Facebook course, is that still a front end at $25? And you didn't never said how much your flagship course is? Uh, yeah, so the, the content marketing for artists course is now $300. Okay. Um, it's probably going to go up with the new year. We haven't finalized that yet, but it's, it's at $300 right now. Uh, the Facebook course was 25. It's now 47. Uh, we're also testing some, some different pricing there. Um, we're doing some, some fun, uh, AB tests to see, uh, which price point makes us the most money. Uh, cause we're, we're, we, we get, uh, we, we actually get, almost as many conversions at the higher, at a higher price point. Um, so the, the base price is 47. We're testing some different price points to see which ones convert best and end up making us the most money in the long run. Uh, and I am going to be putting out a newer entry level product. Um, I have a book coming out, uh, from Harper Collins next summer. And, uh, along with the book, we're going to be introducing some, some guides, like some $10 products, uh, 
over the next year. You've also so, got the Instagram course. And we've also got the Instagram course at twenty five dollars. Okay. Um, so, and then, so the so basically, we've got the guides, which will be coming out at ten dollars. The Instagram course at twenty five. The Facebook course at forty seven, and then the the How to Sell Your Art Online course for three hundred, uh, and then coaching, uh, which varies based on the project. Right, and you're making almost a hundred thousand just from selling all these courses. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so that's a kind of a, a nutshell. I just want to break down a few of the little things that I'm missing um, for what your business looks like today. So in terms of delivery now of all this product, you must have a more robust membership system running. Is that right? Yeah, lots more. I've tested, I've tested a lot of membership site plugins for WordPress. Uh, you know, I went through Wishlist Member. I went through... DAP, Digital Access Pass, I think. Um, we went through S2 member, uh, tried a couple of others, then went back to Wishlist member. Um, I'm, I know too much about tech for my own good. Like, I'm not a, I'm not a web developer, but I know enough to, like, play around with things and, and sort of Google and copy and paste code. So that's sort been sort of a... I gotten in my own way a little bit because I, I know I know enough to do it on my own slowly. And I uh, finally over the last year and a half, I finally pulled myself out of tech and hired a VA who does it all for me. Uh, so now I'm not like worrying about the tech every day, um, which was a big problem because as you can see, I, I went through so many different membership plugins. Right. Um, but you're on wish list now. I'm not on Wishlist now. Oh. Now I'm on I'm on uh, Rainmaker. Rainmaker, okay. Yeah. So the um, blogger platform. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which is is no longer Copy Blogger now. It's it's uh, Rainmaker Digital. Uh, they've re they've rebranded. Yeah. Uh, so it's funny because I loved Wishlist, but uh, the problem I ran into is once you once you hit a certain scale with uh, membership plugins, like you have to get good at server management. And that wasn't something that I wanted to spend time on. Uh, I have a managed hosting plan, and and I decided that I would just move to Rainmaker to make it easier for myself, mm -hmm. rather than rather than trying to do all that. And Rainmaker's been great. They they had some problems with their DNS uh, here in December, but you know I've been on Rainmaker for about a year, and I haven't had any problems other than the the recent DNS problems, which affected a lot of different websites. Uh, you mentioned you hired a VA, so I was going to ask you next, what, what does your team look like today? Who, who works yeah. for you? Yeah, so I've got a technical VA based in the Philippines. Uh, he's, he's good. Um, I used Chris Ducker's uh, service to find the VA. Mm -hmm. And I have a part-time person here in the States who handles all of my social media posting. Uh, so she's she's got a background in social media strategy and a background in, she actually has a master's degree in arts administration and her name's Megan and uh, she is awesome. She handles a lot of our, uh, like all of our Facebook page and all of our Facebook ads and all of the Twitter and Instagram posts and stuff. That's all her. And she also handles on the back end, she handles all of our customer support. So anybody who's having problems getting access to their content that they've purchased or uh, courses that they've purchased or any other questions, uh, that all goes through Megan. Anyone else? That's it. Okay. It's just just the three of us. So you got a tech person, a customer support slash social media person, and yourself. So mm -hmm. when it comes to selling product and delivering product, I'm guessing it's all you. Like, do you write your own sales pages and you obviously create your own webinar content, which turns into course content? Is that right? Yep, absolutely. Uh, the plan I have a I have a couple like a year to two year plan of bringing in one or two more, probably part time people, uh, people who are in sort of either consultant or contractor roles uh, to handle some of the content creation. Um, most of the ideas and the and the actual strategy and content come from me, but I'd like to have somebody handle the production of all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's that's basically it. I don't have plans to turn this into a big company. Uh, that that's not a goal for me. Uh, the, a, the lifestyle business is a goal for me. I, I do plan on doing a lot more speaking. Uh, with the book coming out next year, we're doing a conference. Uh, it's called the Abundant 
Artist Conference. Uh, and you can go to the you can go to abundantartistconference.com to uh, find out more about that. That happens July first and second of twenty sixteen. Uh, and then I'm also speaking for a lot of arts organizations. Uh, a lot of them can't afford to pay somebody to fly out to them, so we're doing webinars uh, for those or for those organizations. Very cool. So you mentioned earlier uh, with the lifestyle business being so important. You said you did some traveling with your wife recently, and you were yeah. running your business. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Jason Van Orden and his wife went over to France uh, beginning of 2014. So we just essentially, we've known them for a long time and we decided, oh, we'll just all go over there and travel together. So we went and shared an apartment with them in Paris for about six months. And then we spent a month in Ireland and a month in London. Just running the business laptop lifestyle sort of thing? Yep. Laptop lifestyle. It was, it was pretty funny because I didn't know that I mean, I sort of knew, I, I knew that the term digital nomad existed or existed, but I didn't know, really know what that meant. And then, uh, as we were getting ready to head over to Europe and I was trying to figure a few things out, I discovered that there's like this whole world of people doing that. And, uh, and I was like, oh, that's fun. Like there's all these people that have already figured it out. So I'll just do what they do. And, uh, and that's worked out pretty well. We, it was funny because the only part of the business that it really impacted was I, it was, I found it very difficult to do one-on-one -on -one coaching mm -hmm. while, while I was traveling because time schedules are so different. You know, we were eight or nine hours ahead, uh, depending on which part of Europe we were in. And, uh, so, so anybody on the U S West coast, it was, it was really difficult to, to get in touch with, um, on a, on a meaningful basis. And, uh, beyond that, uh, everything else in the business went great. Now, uh, sort of wrapping up, Corey, I'm, I'm curious here, two things, which could possibly be answered with one answer. You teach a lot of people how to market themselves online, and you're teaching them to do it in today's environment. So, you know, your story starts early days, and you've really been doing this for a while, and you, you were kind of like six years ago when you started to really get some traction with your blog, so you've had the benefit of long-term blogging to build up an audience. And I still mm -hmm. think, you know, people can still do that. But the fact is a lot of people think, you know, if I start a blog now, it's too competitive. I, I don't see how this could work for me. So my question is, if it's someone who's listening to this, maybe they are an artist, even if they're not, they're someone who's looking to become a digital nomad, so to speak. How do mm -hmm. you advise them to start today? Like what's, what's the first few steps? Yeah, that's interesting. I do think that blogging is pretty competitive now. But that's not necessarily a deterrent. Uh, I think I, I look at guys like Steve Cam over at Nerd Fitness. Like fit, fitness is probably the most competitive industry online, um, if not the most. It's it's one of the most. There, maybe maybe besides the make money online niche. And Steve has done really really well because he has this really specific voice. You know, he's teaching fitness to nerds. And he uses Legos and Star Wars <laughs> and Lord of the Rings to illustrate his points, right? So he knows who he's talking to. He has a unique voice. Uh, he's doing something that's really cool and really interesting. And it's not just, you know, Steve's take on fitness. And that's, that's what I think it takes to succeed with blogging now, is having a really unique voice. So you would still say, start a blog, start an email list. Is this what you tell all your artists to do in, in your training as well? Yes and no. I, I, think, I think you can't just start a blog. You, you, like having, having a platform is important because it's a place where you can send people so that they can get to know you, so they can join your mailing list, so they can buy your products. Uh, and so the blog is one part of it, but you also have to get out and actively market yourself, and you, you need to drive people to your platform. Uh, I think that right now, at this moment in time, at the end of 2015, uh, Facebook ads are still super cheap and super, super effective. You know, where that'll be a year from now, I. I don't know. I think it'll still be good. But right now, you know, you can drive people to your website for a few cents a click, you know, 30, 40 cents a click. Uh, that is a super cheap way to start driving really targeted traffic to your website. Uh, and also, I think that most people don't take enough advantage of 
guest blogging and uh, promotion, doing PR, uh, reaching out to media. Uh, there's still a lot of opportunity there as well. Awesome. All right. So it's, it's you know it's kind of like the same thing we've been talking about from the beginning. Get your platform up there, but you really have to emphasize marketing, and you really have to emphasize your your voice, so you you can break through the noise that is out there today. And that applies for artists as well as experts, authors, you know, teachers, trainers, anyone. It sounds like so. All right, Corey. Um, I'm going to mention your website, so it's pretty clear. It's theabundantartist.com. And you mentioned before, is it theabundantartistconference.com for the conference? Yeah, uh, it's, it, I, I got both domains. So it's theabundantartist.conference. Theabundantartist.com. Oh my gosh. Theabundantartistconference.com or abundantartistconference.com. Okay. Why did I choose this name for my business? <laughs> yeah. Well, I have the same problem with entrepreneurs journey with the hyphen. It's always a problem. Yeah. Um, awesome. So, well, anything else you want to throw in there before I wrap up uh, the interview? No, I appreciate it. I, I, you know, what you're saying about the same stuff we've been teaching for years in online marketing is true. Like the principles of marketing are the same. They don't really change all that much. It's, it, it comes down to your unique voice and how well you execute that marketing. Yeah, that's, that's a challenge. I think a lot of people struggle with what is my unique voice and who do I want to help and then that sort of thing. But I think as an artist, you should be pretty clear. You've got art. That's what, you know, your product is, is you in a lot of ways, right? So, um, Awesome. Corey, thank you for sharing the story. Uh, I can tell you're sort of, you know, just starting to ramp things up, but I like the fact that you're sticking to digital nomad laptop lifestyle. I agree with you with that. I don't see the point in pushing yourself to the place where you have so many staff that you're working 12 hour days again, because that's not fun, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah, keep up the good work, and uh, I'm definitely going to refer my my dad to check out your stuff. And no doubt, everyone probably has an artist in the family somewhere they can refer to theabundantartist.com as well. So that's great. Thanks for joining me on the interview. Thanks so much, Harold. And thank you for listening in to the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. If you want to get the transcript to go along with this, so if you want to read or also the show notes or anything else to do with Corey's interview, you can head to my blog. Easy, easiest way to find that is to Google my name, Yaro, Y-A-R-O. That will take you to the Entrepreneur's Journey blog and click the podcast tab there and you'll find Corey's interview listed among any of the other ones you can listen to as well. Thanks again and I'll talk to you on a future interview. Before you go, if you haven't yet subscribed to the email list for the EJ podcast, you can do that at interviewsclub.com. And also, if you could take a moment right now to leave a review in iTunes for the EJ podcast, I'd really appreciate that. You can do that by going to iTunes and searching for my first name, Yaro, Y-A-R-O, and that will lead you to the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast where you can find the review button and leave your feedback. Thanks again for doing that. Okay, that's the interview today done. I'll speak to you on the very next Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. My name is Yaro. Talk to you soon. Yeah.